This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau, authors of Mass Destruction, Bad Guy Feds, and Uniforms. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode 31 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. I want to thank Gold Shield patron Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com and Coffee Club patrons Joan Raymond, Guy Alton, Natasha Bajima, Natalie Borelli, Joe Trent, Siobhan Pope, Leah Cutter, Ryan Kinmill, Richard Phillips, Robin Lyons, Jean De Rocher, Craig Kingsman, Kate Wagner, Marco Carocari, and Victoria Kazarian. Your support keeps this podcast going, so please support all of these amazing authors by visiting their author websites and reading their books. You can find links to their websites in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 31. If you have your own author business, you should be getting patrons yourself, so consider joining Patreon. It's free for you, and it allows your readers to support you financially through monthly micropayments. So give your fans a chance to show their support by creating your own Patreon account right now. To learn more, visit writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Wow, I cannot believe it is March already. Yesterday, I sent out the Writer's Detective APB, which is my monthly newsletter. And it's an email packed full of links to websites, articles, uh, PDF documents that I create with you, the crime fiction writer, in mind. And I send it out on the last day of each month. So if you missed the January and or February APBs, you can sign up right now by going to writersdetective.com forward slash mailing list, which is all one word. And once you confirm your email address, you'll get the January and February APBs sent to you immediately. Uh, and then you'll be set up to receive all the future ones as well. So this isn't a bunch of spam or stuff for you to buy. It's just links to things you will actually find useful for your writing research. So again, the link to join is writersdetective.com forward slash mailing list. And speaking of useful research, my friend Natasha Bajima is launching the Authors of Mass Destruction podcast on March 3rd. So we're just uh, two days away. Natasha is an expert in national security security, weapons of mass destruction, and emerging technologies. And she's also an author. Her podcast is all about relating these topics to your writing. So be sure to subscribe to the Authors of Mass Destruction podcast starting March 3rd. And you might even hear a familiar voice in an upcoming episode talking about law enforcement responses to a WMD event and why getting my DNA tested probably wasn't a good idea. That's the Authors of Mass Destruction podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and most of your other favorite podcast listening apps. Go check it out. And before I get into this week's questions, I want to say congratulations to my friend Max Delalo on his new book, The Chef. It's a book he co-authored with James Patterson. You may have heard of that guy. Um, and they just hit number one on the Wall Street Journal uh, bestseller list and number two on the New York Times bestseller list. So congrats, Max. Celebratory drinks are definitely on me next time. And for everyone else, yes, Max has a standing invitation to come on the podcast. But like most great writers, this whole public speaking thing goes against so many levels of introverted nope. <laughs> but I'm trying to wear him down with gentle pressure applied relentlessly. We will get him on the podcast eventually. You hear that, Max? Eventually, you'll get on here. It may take a couple cocktails, but we'll get you on here. So congrats again, Max. I am so happy for you. Todd Payne writes, Hi, Adam. I'm a new and aspiring screenwriter. I'm still working my way through your podcasts, which are fantastic, by the way. Thank you, Todd. I just listened to the podcast about jurisdictions and have a question about law enforcement turned criminal. Who would be the primary investigator if a CIA, FBI, or other federal agent were arrested by local law enforcement as a suspect in a crime? 
Maybe they were captured and later discovered to be an active or suspended agent. How would the federal agencies be involved, if at all? And what about active military personnel? Not sure if you've addressed this already, but looking forward to your answer. Thanks. Just getting started with the stuff, so nothing to promote yet. Todd. Thanks, Todd. Um, Now, in most cases that I can think of, the local law enforcement agency that arrested this agent would still remain the investigating agency. The way the federal agency would get involved would be in how the local law enforcement agency's criminal investigation um, would end up kicking off an internal investigation by the federal agency. You've likely heard of Internal Affairs, or IA, as we often call it, as the name for this kind of unit, Um, but that can vary. I know that the FBI calls theirs OPR, which stands for Office of Professional Responsibility. So if a police department considers an FBI special agent as a suspect in a crime, then the police department may reach out to FBI OPR to coordinate investigations. There'll be two separate ones. It'll, one will be the criminal investigation. The other will be the federal internal affairs investigation or OPR investigation. But they'll coordinate those investigations, and they may also get help with making the arrest. Because the thing to keep in mind with cases where a cop or a special agent is the suspect is that they're usually armed, and they have a lot to lose. So if I knew I had to arrest a cop or an FBI agent, I would arrange to have them assign some kind of errand or like brief assignment that would require them to become disarmed. Like delivering paperwork to a booking officer in the jail is a good example. You know, it's where you're required to lock up your weapon before going into the secured jail facility. So once that agent or officer is inside the facility um, and unarmed on their little errand, um, then I'd have the arresting officers contact him and place him under arrest there. Or at least that's how I would do it to minimize the chances of... Um, not so much that I'm worried about him trying to shoot and kill the officers as much as I'm worried about um, him trying to kill himself. For active military personnel, though, uh, things could be different, actually. In the United States, all active military personnel are subject to not only the state and federal laws that we're all subject to, but they're also subject subject to the laws of UCMJ, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So just like the bank robbery example I gave on that previous episode, where I talked about the legal concept of dual sovereignty, um, a local law enforcement agency might bring in NCIS, uh, Army CID, or Air Force OSI into the investigation and work it jointly. And this is because UCMJ will have far more drastic consequences if the UCMJ law applies to that service member or to the crime that's being alleged. So it's a far bigger deal. Like just as an example, it's a far bigger deal to be a 20 year old U S Navy sailor who is subject to UCMJ while on Liberty and smoking weed than say a 20 year old civilian smoking the same weed in a state where recreational cannabis is considered legal. So obviously there are much greater teeth Uh, and much bigger stakes um, when you're involving somebody who is subject to UCMJ. And then back on the federal agent thing, one other thing as far as how a federal agency might get involved in an arrest, especially if this is an on-view arrest rather than something where they're figuring out how to go arrest the agent, if the agent is working undercover and the agent is arrested, you would very likely have that UC agent's handler, which would be another federal agency or another federal agent from that same agency, um, possibly a supervisor, they would be contacting that police department pretty quickly. And you would have bosses from both agencies get involved um, because it's very possible that the crime that the undercover agent was arrested for um, might be part of a larger investigation. And it may be something that's going to be alleged and it may not have been what the officer perceived as the crime committed by this undercover agent may not have actually been the truth of what's happening. Um, When we're working undercover cases, a lot of times there are what we'll call street theater where we set up um, events for the benefit of the criminals that we're working amongst um, 
to think that we're committing a crime where in fact, it's not really the case. It's something that's completely staged. Um, but if a patrol officer happened upon it and happened to see this, they too might think that this was a crime that was being committed. So in, in, they wouldn't necessarily deconflict with the local agency just because the feds wouldn't know who might be, you know, corrupt or, or in contact with this outlaw group. So it's very possible that, um, the UC agent might not actually have committed the crime, but it could have appeared to have been done. And so in that case, you would definitely have, um, the handler come in and contact the police department and see about um, getting things smoothed over. And if not released, at least protected the um, protecting that you see from harm's way while he was in custody. And then lastly, if we're talking about a, about the CIA, there is a big difference between a CIA officer and a CIA agent. I think I've talked about this before, but just to hammer this home real quick, an officer for the CIA is an actual employee of the CIA. It's what we think about when we're talking about, you know, any kind of spy character um, employee of the CIA, that that is an officer or a case officer. Whereas an agent is the term that the CIA uses for an informant. So if you're saying CIA agent, it's actually the snitch. It's not the actual employee of the CIA. I know it's a small detail, but it's one of those ones that any serious fan of the espionage genre is definitely going to key on immediately. So just be sure not to fall into that trap. Thank you so much for the question, Todd. This week's next question comes from the Facebook group. Author Gianni Holmes writes, keyword, police uniform. Hoping maybe someone from California could direct me in the correct answer. I'd like to know the variation of the policeman's uniform according to rank. Can I find that info anywhere? More pressing, do police captains wear the same uniform but with different badges, stripes, etc. to differentiate them, or are their uniforms designed differently? Thank you. Uniforms and insignias will definitely vary by agencies, uh, and some agencies won't have the rank of captain at all. Um, but that said, most California agencies will have their captains or other management executive command level staff wear the same color uniforms as the rest of the department, but they'll have a different rank insignia. So that could be a rocker at the top of their badge that will say captain or whatever their rank is in addition to um, some sort of insignia that will be on their collar. So like a lieutenant or a captain um, or a commander or whatever will have similar to the military. Um, so like for the captain example, they may, they may wear that military style captain's bars, whether they are gold or silver may depend on the color scheme of that department's uniform. Some agencies may use different military style, it may still be military style insignias, but they may use them to mean something else. I've seen some agencies where they use stars for captains, where in the military, a, a star would be indicative of a general. So my suggestion is either to pick a specific agency um, to write about, or at least pick an agency to base your fictional department off of, and then do some research into their ranks in uniforms. Most of that can be found online nowadays, and you can always reach out, um, obviously, here for more help with specific research. Since the question was about California, you'll notice that the chiefs of LAPD and San Francisco PD, or even the sheriff of Los Angeles, they all wear the same exact color uniforms as their patrol officers or their patrol deputies. East Coast law enforcement agencies um are the ones that you're more commonly going to see a change in uniform color. So once you get to the management level rank, you may wear a different uniform shirt color. So like as NYPD, New York Police Department, as an example, their police officers wear blue shirts up until the rank of lieutenant. And then once you're at lieutenant or above, you then wear a white uniform shirt. And to help you with the research, I will include links to both the LAPD rank structure um, and symbols, which is 
uh, is unique compared to um, the rest of the typical structures for police departments across the country, as well as a link to the NYPD uniform and ranks. But again, if you just search for the agency uh, that you are kind of envisioning in your head or that location, it's pretty easy nowadays uh, through the internet to be able to find what uniforms they're wearing and then what would be specific to that um, rank. And real quick, I talked about virtual private networks or VPNs in episode 30 and how you can use a VPN to encrypt your internet traffic, change which city or country your internet connection appears to be from, as well as keeping prying eyes from monitoring your search histories, which might be important to crime fiction writers researching things like serial killers and how to get rid of DNA evidence. Um, but anyway, if you'd like the security of a highly rated VPN for less than $3 a month, check out private internet access by going to writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash VPN. Thank you for listening to episode 31 of the Writers Detective Bureau podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and just as a reminder, this podcast runs off of your questions. So please submit your crime fiction questions, or you can just say hello by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. You can put your questions in there. So thanks for listening. Have a great week. Write well. Write well.